makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London with the conversations that matter. And here's what's coming up on today's program. Fed officials push back against bets of aggressive rate cuts next year, threatening a bumper global stock rally. Israel dismisses a call by European leaders for a sustainable ceasefire in Gaza. Meanwhile, global shipping companies are on alert amid rising threats to containers in the Red Sea. Plus, China's iPhone ban ramps up with more staff set to be barred from bringing foreign mobile devices into the office. So first things first, we have the IFO number. So we'll get onto that in a second. I'm also really looking forward to our conversation with Clement Fust to try and understand what the German economy does next. Now, that December IFO business confidence coming in at 86.4 instead of the estimate 87.7. So it is a little bit below estimates. But at the same time, there's, I guess, so much bias that central banks will be here to support central, you know, a lot of the stocks that we're seeing gains uh, pretty much um, you know, in tandem with that. So European stocks a little bit hesitant. We did have a weak session in Asia. Again, this is after the Federal Reserve actually pushed back against bets of aggressive interest rate cuts next year. Dollar broadly steady. Yields on two-year treasuries dropping at two basis points, trimming gains made on Friday. We did hear then the New York Fed president, John Williams, leading a course of officials in saying it's just too early to begin to think about lower borrowing costs. So we have the EFO figures. We'll have everything, of course, um, to look at what 2024 will bring in just a moment. We'll be getting more insights from the EFO Institute president. He's Clemens Fuss. But let's get another take on the German-European economy with T.S. Lombard's head of macro strategy, Skyler Montgomery Koning. Skyler, as always, thanks so much for joining us. Now, first of all, I, I know we're looking at the German economy with the IFO Institute, um, but in general, if you look at uh, some of these stocks, there's a lot of question on whether, you know, the Fed can really ease and cut as much as the, the markets are pricing in. Yeah, absolutely. I think people are, are really questioning what the Fed can do. And what you don't see is what's under the hood, right? In terms of if you look at short term interest rate markets, they are an accumulation of views. And I think the market's really caught between two views. One being we get a recession and significant Fed cuts because we are in restrictive territory. And to get down to not restrictive or even neutral, you need to cut a lot. Or we get a soft landing and something more in line with the Fed dots, which is something like 75 basis points, and the market's pricing quite a lot more than that. So I think you know the market and consensus is stuck between these two scenarios, and the equity market would rather run with the soft landing narrative than the recession one. But does it make sense, Skylar, if you look at the everything rally, does it actually make sense given all of the uneasiness that we're seeing with the economy and the fact that even if the Fed were to cut interest rates soon, we don't really know if that's a good thing because they just see inflation going down or whether they worry about a, a heavy recession? This is the struggle, right? Because all else being equal, lower rates is good for equities and it's good for bonds. For equities, it means future cash flows are discounted at a lower rate. The problem is that interest rates are usually cut when the economy is slowing. And equities care about growth because slowing growth means slowing earnings. And if you look at the past 10 easing cycles, on average, returns are actually positive. But there's a wide range of outcomes with returns negative in almost half of the past easing cycles. And that's because, as I said, it matters why the Fed is easing. If the Fed is easing because inflation is falling rather than because of an impending recession, then equities can hold up. And that's what we think will happen. So we have a relatively pro-risk stance. But the risk is that, you know, it looks like we're getting a recession before we get that soft landing. So, Skylar, what does it mean for asset allocation? Where do you want to be invested in early 2024? So for us, the highlight for 2024 is obviously that we're at the start of the easing cycle. So all else equal, that's positive for equities and it's positive for bonds. Um, right now, there is quite a lot of easing price is the worry. So our expectation of a soft landing, while that means we have a pro-risk stance, um, easing cycles do tend to be bumpy for stocks. So we aren't massively overweight. We're cautiously pro-risk. At the same time, we like fixed income because of the carry. But the rally we've seen already does look quite exuberant. And if we don't get a recession, um, you know, it, it does look quite a lot. So we're modestly underweight under government bonds. But we do like adding duration and credit. So total returns we think will benefit there from government bond rallies. But you'd also expect rallies on, on positive risk moves. 
Great. Thank you so much. Uh, of course, Skyler Montgomery coding there from TS Lombard. Now, let's also get more from the IFO Institute President Clemens Fust on the figures that came out just minutes ago. December IFO business confidence, 86.4. That's a touch below estimates. Mr. Fust, as always, thank you for joining us. How much are you, do you worry about the German economy in 2024? Yes, the situation is clearly weak. The economy is weak and we've been waiting for a recovery now for some time and it's not coming. So this is worrying. Uh, what's contributed to that is certainly the uncertainty surrounding the constitutional court ruling in Germany and the impact on the public budget. Uh, but there are other unresolved issues like high energy prices, uh, frictions in international trade. Uh, so this uh, is holding the German economy back. But so, do you believe the economy is actually slipping back? And so is the rebound that we were expecting at this time, is that further delayed? It looks like it's further delayed. Uh, in, in, in our forecast, we expected uh, a flat end of the year, so zero growth in the last quarter. And this may now tip us into... Uh, another technical recession. Q3 was negative and Q4 may now also be negative. Uh, so the recovery, if it comes, is certainly further delayed. So do you think uh, a recession in the second half is now confirmed? Yeah, it's, it's not confirmed, but it's becoming increasingly likely because we are just, uh, you know, we, so we expected a zero. And now with this incoming data, it's, it may very well be that we have a negative reading. Uh, of course, this is all, all very close to zero. The bigger issue is that the German economy is stagnating more or less. Uh, slightly above or below zero, but uh, we uh, are waiting for this recovery, which is not coming, and that is certainly a, a matter of concern. But, uh, Mr. Fuchs, you, you mentioned, of course, you know, the, the German government finally agreeing on this budget after negotiations that at times we understand were pretty tense. The measures include subsidy cuts, but also they include a higher carbon price. So what's the impact of those measures actually on inflation and growth going forward? So our expectation is that the impact on growth will be very limited, maybe 0.1 or 0.2 percentage points lower. Uh, that's not the big issue. The, the issue is maybe more the, the fact that there is a lot of uncertainty about economic policy going forward. Uh, and, and even now, the government has made, has found a compromise on the cuts, but this compromise is now called into question again. So this uncertainty is just not going away. At the same time, what we would need is a convincing strategy, for economic policy strategy, to get back to growth, a strategy for a recovery. And this strategy is missing completely. Uh, and I, I guess that, ex that is part of the story that explains why the German economy is not recovering. Of course, there are other factors. The global uh, economy, uh, global trade is relatively weak, so that doesn't help either. Uh, how much of the German rebound is actually at the mercy of what happens in the U.S. and what happens in China? Uh, the U.S. and China are the most important export markets for the German economy. So what happens there is very important for Germany. At the same time, Germany faces some structural issues. So it's maybe less clear than in the past that an upswing in global trade will also uh, benefit the German economy as it did before. So we have a combination of uh, concerns about the global economy, maybe lacking dynamism coming from the outside and domestic uh, structural issues. If we think about the car industry, uh, all the issues with e-mobility, um, autonomous driving, IAT problems. So it's this mixture of structural problems and uh, weak demand from the outside. But how much do you think uh, the impact, I guess, of higher interest rates in Germany have already worked their way through the economy? Uh, so higher interest rates have certainly had a strong impact on the construction sector. So that's another reason why the economy is stagnating, uh, especially uh, in, in, in construction. Uh, we have a very weak development. The IFO index has now reached its lowest level since 2005 in construction. Uh, and uh, that also weighs on the German economy. It's high interest rates, but it also, it's also high construction costs and complex planning procedures. Uh, these combinations, this combination of factors is really toxic for the construction mm -hmm. industry. 
And Mr. Fus, this is not going to ease up anytime soon. When do you expect it to, to normalize a little bit? Well, there are two factors that may help. First of all, wages are growing relatively quickly and employment is still strong. Uh, and then we do expect interest rates to decline uh, maybe in the second half of 2024. And if the economy is weaker, this may even come earlier. So these may be two factors supporting the economy. Uh, and these are two factors that may uh, help the economy to grow at least a little bit in the coming year. Okay, Mr. Fust, thank you so much for joining us. Clemens Fust, there, the president of the IFO Institute. We'll have plenty more ahead on stocks, on central banks, and on the German economy. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> Twenty twenty three looks like it's going to end up being a very substantial reduction in inflation without a big increase in the unemployment rate. Mm -hmm. That's the golden path that I talked about. But we're still above the target. We got to get inflation right. down to target before it, 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 until we're convinced that we're on path to that. It, it's it's an overstatement to to be counting the chickens. Well, Chicago Fed President Austin Goolsby, they're speaking on CBS. Now, let's continue our conversation with T.S. Lombard's head of macro strategy, Skyler Montgomery Coning, plus our very own Sofia Orta Ecosta. So thank you, Sofia, for joining us. Skyler, let's go back to something that we were talking about on central banks in general. And I know you have a note out talking about U.S. dollar strength and the fact that actually that in itself doesn't support a whole asset class. How do you see the U.S. dollar performing in 2024? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's very interesting right now, right? Because momentum has clearly moved against the dollar. The Fed has come out as, as one of the most dovish G3s, and that's clearly weighing on the currency. But I think 2024 is a different story. And the strongest case for dollar upside is the strength in the economy, especially when you consider the economic backdrop of the major counterparts. Europe and the UK are in stagnation. Data in China is bottoming, but it's not providing a growth impulse. It's an L-shaped recovery. And China and the U.S. are the two main global growth engines. So that means that with China not adding to growth, whether the U.S. enters a recession or data bottoms, the U.S. is the marginal provider of growth for the rest of DM, meaning we think U.S. exceptionalism is likely to continue. And that economic divergence isn't reflected in policy expectations. I think, you know, when people are doing their year ahead forecasts, they really rely on dollar valuation as well as the dollar ball cycle. And that's told you to be um, long euro dollar for quite some time. But there are structural factors that have changed within the global economy. That means that there's a reason for that overvaluation and that extended bull cycle. Um, and, and Sophia, I guess, and this is something that we were, you know, trying to, to game theory with Skyler. It's basically the, the idea that central banks are likely to shift to easing monetary policy. The economy continues to slow. Inflationary pressures remain subdued. What if we were wrong? Like, what are some of the forces that we should be looking out for early next year? It's dangerous when you have kind of a really strong consensus in the market in either direction, right? And now you really have um, everyone kind of betting on that easing from the Fed a lot more aggressively than they were uh, betting on a few a few months ago. Uh, but also the long yen trade. I mean, that's been a favorite play uh, from f in the market for at least three years now. And it's always, always disappointed. And now there's so much conviction around that. Let's see if 2024 will actually be the year uh, that that, you know, that actually uh, works, that trade actually works. So I, I think the positioning is something to watch out for when there's so much kind of certainty uh, amongst traders, uh, these kind of one way bets. And speaking of one way bets, you know, I do think uh, the lesson for investors this year was China. There was a very, very one way bet there at the beginning of the year. And we know how that's panned out. Again, disappointing returns there. Um, so, you know, I think I think one key theme, Francine, is, is really kind of to how to you, how do you hedge this going into next year if there's so much conviction uh, that you know what everyone thinks is going to happen this kind of central bank easing cycle will happen at the same time and kind of e easier uh, and faster than than people are expecting and Skyler, this goes back to something that you know again we were trying to to look at i asked you about your global asset allocation but also you know what do you do with unleveraged or leverage at the moment it's kind of it has i don't know whether that's the, the main theme that we don't talk about for next year 
Yeah, it's quite hard, right? In terms of when you have interest rates pinging around, it affects what you do with leverage quite considerably. Um, I think for us, you know, when we think about next year, the main theme we're really focusing on is as a risk is this idea that you could get a return of term premia in terms of we've had this roundabout move in term premia. Um, and, you know, it should be considerably higher than it is right now as in term premium on the 10 year point is negative. And so a risk for us as we look into next year around all of these yield gyrations is that actually, you know, curve steepening is uh, amplified by the fact that you have to have a higher long end yield because of this term premium having to come back from being negative to something more around 100 basis points or even, you know, the average is more around 150 basis points. So that's something that I think is maybe underappreciated next year is this risk that longer end yields, while you might get a, a rally still on, on Fed cuts, won't be um, as uh, they won't respond as much to easing as you will have seen in historic cycles. And so, the, I mean, from that, basically, I guess you go from like region to region or country to country, which mm. is why, you know, you and your team are spending a lot of time trying to figure that out. Mm, yes. And, and again, don't forget about earnings, Fran, because we're talking about uh, the, you know, how markets respond uh, to expectations of Fed easing. And we had a, a record high in the Nasdaq last week. Um, but, you know, equity markets, they should kind of reflect what companies are doing on the ground. And there are some warnings. We're seeing some some of this in the t uh, 2024 outlooks for next year, reminding investors to kind of like go back down to basics and look at how companies are faring because the interest rate environment of this year, the higher interest rate environment this year, hasn't quite fed through to the real economy. So we could see some of that lagged pain. We are looking uh, w on the team. We look a lot at the UK. That's been a kind of unloved market for a very long time. Um, I have bad news here for anyone who wants to be bullish on the UK. It doesn't look like it's, it's still a very hard sell for investors no. because even though you have cheap valuations, it's just not it's not an attractive market for a lot of money market for a lot of funds. I was going to say it, it is cheap, Skylar. So I don't know whether, you know, there are opportunities in, in, in the UK in certain parts of the market or, or whether Skylar, it's a it's a type of market that you look at. Yeah, um, absolutely. In terms of for us, when we think about UK assets next year, Really, the dominant theme is still this kind of state of stagflation. So our leading indicators, they're hovering around zero, which is consistent with flat GDP for the year. Um, PMIs, they're still deteriorating. The service, set, service sector is certainly slowing down. And what we're seeing is that the tightening cycle is biting. So the buffer of financial wealth in the UK has evaporated. That means there isn't protection as the effects of previous tightening start to feed through. And this is a gradual thing. Most mortgages in the UK are two to five years. So the bank started tightening at the end of 2021. Um, so that's around two years ago. And so that will increasingly bite as homeowners are forced to get new mortgages. So the growth outlook isn't especially rosy. And that means that it's hard to be allocated in equities. But it does mean that fixed income in the UK is more appealing. Okay, Skylar and Sophia, thank you so much for joining us. T.S. Lombard, Skylar Montgomery Koning, and Bloomberg's Sophia Orta Ecosta. Coming up, Israel's foreign minister dismisses appeals for a truce as France, the UK, and Germany call for a sustainable ceasefire. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. Well, Israel is pushing back on intensifying calls for a ceasefire. That's after France, the UK and Germany urged efforts towards halting the war as a civilian death toll mounts and tensions in the wider region continue to simmer. Well, joining us now is Bloomberg's Anna Kreitcher. Dana, will Netanyahu listen to these warnings from other countries? So the, UAE is, uh, the EU is definitely upping the rhetoric for an immediate ceasefire release of hostages. This comes after the U.S. Um, last week uh, warned Israel that it could be losing international support if it doesn't heed that warning and also if it doesn't recognize that a two-state two solution is the optimal solution to uh, resolve this conflict indefinitely. There is no sign that, that Israel is going to stop or or amend its operations on the ground in Gaza um, or will he to uh, an immediate ceasefire call um, their aim is to eliminate Hamas but what that means is is not very clear um, it also doesn't we don't know what it means in terms of what are the conditions that Hamas is effectively eliminated 
in Gaza. Um, and the U.S. is asking or pushing uh, Israel to do more surgical attacks uh, in Gaza as the death toll is nearing 19,000 in the span of three months now since the war started. Um, but that could also be difficult given that Gaza is heavily populated um, and Hamas's network is um, quite intricate underground. Yeah, I mean, there's so much, you know, the, the, the world, frankly, is turning. Um, and I guess something will have to come to head. Is there anyone that Netanyahu would listen to? Um, this is hard to say. There, the calls have been mounting ever since we had the General Assembly call. We had a, a UN Security Council resolution, which was vetoed by the U.S., but still it was quite a, a significant symbolic move internationally. Um, Netanyahu is growing under pressure internationally and domestically as well. With the killing of the three uh, hostages uh, over the weekend, there is division uh, internationally on how Israel is conducting this war and also internally. Dana, thank you so much for the update. Dana Kreitsche there. Now coming up, the UK and Italy agree to jointly fund migrant repatriations in Africa. We'll have the latest next. Fed officials push back against bets of aggressive rate cuts next year, threatening a bumper global stock rally. Germany's IFO business confidence deteriorates in December, surprising economists and increasing the chances of a recession. And Israel dismisses a call by European leaders for a sustainable ceasefire in Gaza. Meanwhile, global shipping companies are on alert amid rising threats to containers in the Red Sea. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, the UK and Italy have agreed to jointly finance migrant repatriations in Africa. The deal comes after Prime Ministers Sunak and Maloney met in Rome this weekend. Well, joining us now is Bloomberg's Alessandra Migliaccio in Rome. Alessandra, good morning. So illegal immigration has been a common issue for both of these leaders. What would this deal actually do? Hello, thank you. Um, yes, well, the deal is indeed, it's about repatriation uh, of migrants Basically, people who were getting stuck in Tunisia, the idea is that, that the UK and Italy would pay for them to be repatriated so that they're not trapped there, so that they're not pushed to further try these extremely dangerous uh, voyages to Italy, often by sea, where many of them unfortunately drown. Uh, and then, as we know from Italy, they often move to Northern Europe and they can get as far up as the UK. The thing is that, you know, we're being told this is very complicated. I mean, how is this actually going to work? Is it actually going to work because you're paying them to, to do what? To actually leave? You're actually making sure they get back to their countries? Or is it money that may be sort of lost in space, quote unquote, because you're not sure then what happens to these migrants and if they can actually come back and try again? Um, but it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a publicity stunt, many, many analysts are telling us, because it's just a way for Sunak and Maloney to show that they care about this issue, that they're trying to do something, that they're trying to do something visible, a bit like the Rwanda plan for Sunak or the Albania plan for Maloney. And that is, I think, their main goal. Their main goal is to show they're trying to do something on migration. But, I mean, this, again, was highly unusual because Sunak, it's not only that he showed up in Rome. He actually showed up at the party of Giorgia Meloni, who in the past has been controversial. Billionaire Elon Musk was also there, arguably the star attraction of the event. What did he have to send? Frankly, why was he there? I mean, really, you're right, Francine. It was very weird. Um, it's a win for Meloni because this is a... It was historically a right-wing party conference, and it wasn't very well attended, let's say, put it that way. And now, suddenly, you have Shunak, you have Musk showing up, you have some members of the opposition as well going. Um, there was one member of the opposition speaking about LGBTQ rights. Uh, Musk was there. Basically, uh, he spoke about demographics. He spoke about his concern that European nations are... Uh, not having enough children, especially Italy. Italy is one of the nations that's having the fewest uh, children right now in the world, uh, particularly in Europe. And so he was very concerned about this. He says they're losing their identity, uh, whatever that means. So it was really a strange mix of people uh, coming together. I guess Sunak wants to show, you know, that he's doing something about migration, so he's moving a bit more to the right to get those right-wing votes. Meloni is trying actually to move more to the center and to show her legitimacy with all these people. Musk, has his agenda. We're not quite sure what he's trying to do. Um, but certainly it made Meloni look like she's at the center of the world stage. So I think a win for her, you know, regardless what it all means in the big picture.
So interesting. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Mignaccio, there from our Rome Bureau. Now, uh, Vivendi has also begun legal action against Telecom Italia for its 22 billion euro landline network sale. Now, the French media giant, which is the Italian company's biggest shareholder, is challenging the decision to go ahead with the disposal of the asset. Now, Telecom Italia is planning to sell the network to U.S.-based investment firm KKR. And telecommunications company Iliad has submitted a proposal to merge its Italian operations with Vodafone. Now, the proposal is for the creation of a new entity where both parties would hold 50%. Under the proposal, Vodafone Italia would have enterprise valuation of just shy of 10.5 billion euros, Vodafone shares higher in early London trading. Now, Bloomberg has also learned that more Chinese agencies and government-backed firms have ordered staff to stop bringing iPhones and other foreign devices to work. Now, Apple's Asia suppliers are trading in the red this morning off the back of the news. For more, I'm joined by Bloomberg's Alex Webb. Alex, OK, there's a lot going on here, but basically just how much has China ramped up efforts to ban iPhone in its agencies? So what we'd heard in September was that around Beijing and Tianjin, there was uh, a certain, there were a certain number of government agencies, also some big Chinese state owned companies such as a Petro a China had instructed employees not to buy iPhones or bring iPhones to work, I should say. What, we, what the reporting now shows is there are eight states at least and agencies and state-owned companies in those regions who are asking very much the same thing. That's a, a, a sort of bigger rollout of this strategy. The government is denying that this is a sort of a top-down edict, but there certainly seems to be a pattern emerging. So why is China doing this exactly and, and how far will they go? Is this like, does it really spell trouble for Apple? So at this stage, it's, it's not catastrophic for Apple. We've seen something similar maybe six, seven years ago where there was a sort of upsurge in uh, you know, nationalist fervor around buying Chinese devices. And that's when you saw companies like Oppo and Vivo come through and Huawei itself. That did hit Apple's sales. They declined over the subsequent few years. Uh, they have recently been resurging. So it might take a bit of a dent out of that. But it won't necessarily be the actual bands that do it. It'll be more the kind of messaging about what owning a, an, a foreign made device, well, not necessarily foreign made, but no foreign brand right. device <laughs> like Apple or indeed Samsung. Um, it could mean. So that would be the pain amidst all of this. There is greater emphasis being placed on Huawei, which has been the subject of US export controls. They released a device in August, which was a lot more advanced than the US thought was possible. Um, so there is an emph greater emphasis being placed on those homegrown manufacturers. So, I mean, is ban actually feasible? Like, what can replace an Apple? But the challenge for China isn't necessarily that they couldn't ban them, that you know, they could. It's more that Apple employs directly and indirectly millions of people in China to make their devices. And so you would actually, there's a risk here that you'd be you know, cutting off your nose to spite your face to a certain degree. There's a symbiotic relationship to a great extent between Apple and China. Doesn't mean it's completely impossible, but it would seem highly unlikely. All right, Alex, always on the best stories. We'll have plenty more, of course, on this uh, story with Alex Webb throughout the day. Now, in Hong Kong, former media mogul Jimmy Lai is facing charges in the city's highest profile national security case. Lai is essentially standing trial for acts of self-expression there once openly permitted in the former British colony. Now, the U.S. and the U.K. have called on Hong Kong to release a 76-year-old condemning the prosecution. China has hit back, describing the remarks as blatant political maneuvering. Well, Bloomberg's Rebecca Chun Wilkins has more. We are here outside West Kowloon Magistrates Court on day one of what is going to be a landmark trial for Hong Kong. Uh, Jimmy Lai facing national security and other sedition charges. Now, it's really significant for the city because the critics have said that the proceedings undermine the rule of law that has for so long underpinned the success of Hong Kong as a financial center. The other thing that will be closely scrutinized is the condition of Lai himself. There have been very, very few public images uh, made available of him, but in the last one, he appeared to be thinner. Uh, and Lai's own family have warned about some of the health conditions that he is suffering. And the third big element is the question of geopolit geopolitics here and whether or not this becomes a flashpoint, particularly for U.S. relations with China and the U.K.'s relations with China, too. We already had a statement from the U.S. Uh, warning, uh, calling for the immediate release of Jimmy Lai. Now, coming up, we'll be joined by Tom Atheron, the chief executive of London store Fortnum & Mason, as we take a look at how consumer spending is doing this festive season. This is Bloomberg.
Now, predictions for consumer spending this holiday season remain downbeat. UK retail sales have struggled in the run-up to Christmas, and that trend is set to continue when we get the latest data this week. Now, according to the Centre of Economics and Business Research, people are spending more but ending up with less. Now, for more on what the UK retail sector is looking like this festive season, I'm joined by Tom Atherton, the chief executive of Fortnum and Mason. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Tom. I mean, you're a little bit different, right, to, to retail because yeah. it's, it's really about Christmas. I don't know how much you make in terms of sales for the year, but I imagine it's like 60% because you think Christmas, you think Fortnum. How are sales doing? So thanks for having me. Nice to see you, Francine. Um, it's, uh, Christmas is hugely important to us, as you'd expect. Um, and actually, after a sort of relatively slow start, I would say, October and November were probably a bit more muted. Um, what we've seen over December is a real ramp up in interest mm -hmm. for uh, sh people shopping, certainly at Fortnum's, both in store and online. So okay. we're pleased with the way things are going so far. And are, are they buying the same things as they were last year? Are they trading up? Are they buying fewer but more expensive or, or less but you know, cheaper? They're definitely being more cautious and more thoughtful in the way that they spend their money. I think when times are tough, for all the reasons that we understand, people do spend a bit more time to think about what they want to buy and where they want to spend their money. Um, and I think Fortnum's, which is actually a business that attracts a very, very broad demographic, not just international tourists, but also a big domestic business, um, uh, can attract people who are just looking for that, that small moment of joy. And I think that we're quite good at um, providing that. But is it tourists that are coming? I mean, again, if you can break down kind of like what you've seen so far. Now, you keep on hearing that there could be also a very late surge in, in Christmas spending. So very late surge in Christmas spending. Um, it's not so much tourists at this time of year. It tends to be more domestic audience, actually. Um, the, uh, we, we see a much more international trade over the course of the summer when London is a very attractive place for people to visit. But at Christmas, it tends to be much more uh, domestic, uh, uh, domestic consumers um, shopping for something special. So, so it's, is, is it worse than last year or is it too soon to say? No, it's better than last year, I would say. Okay. Um, uh, but uh, but uh, as I said, quite muted over, over the course of yep. October and November. And then I think once Black Friday was out of the way, people suddenly thought, I need to go and shop. And I think that what they're looking for is something... Um, uh, something small and mm -hmm. special, so they might not have spent as much money as last year, but they come to places like Fortnum's where they can get, you know, a jar of jam, their mm -hmm. sort of, uh, yeah. their, their entry yeah. into luxury uh, for a relatively small amount of money. But of course, it's the world's best jam, and that's why they come to us. Of course, no advertising here. <laughs> Don't try any <laughs> other jam. Um, uh, Tom, can you give us a, a sense of why do you think that actually people are spending a little bit later? or, you know, going to the shops a bit later. We had supply chain issues last year. I don't know whether th that kept people off the streets. Or we had the strikes last year. Yes, we did. So the train strikes make a big difference every time. And I was really disheartened to hear that they were starting train strikes again a couple of weeks mm. ago. That actually didn't seem to have too much of an effect uh, this year, which was really good. I do think people are um, spending later because they're just being more yeah. careful about what and where they spend their money and what on. And I think, you know, the days of uh, just going out and, uh, uh, and spending a lot of money having a fantastic Christmas, I think are much more muted this year and people are just being much more thoughtful. Um, but it's good to see that the train strikes aren't there. The supply chain issues aren't there this year. We haven't had those really significant yeah. winter storms over Black Friday, which means that the courier businesses can never catch up if they get behind at that point. So it's felt like it's much more organised and much more stable this year, and it's good to see. But also people are coming back into shops as well. I think what happened over COVID was that people were saying that it was the end of shopping and everything was going to go online. And I think what we've seen over the last couple of years is the resurgence mm -hmm. in shopping in real life, which, of course, yeah. uh, is what Fortnum's is yeah. all about. But this is also because of the Christmas lights, because it's, it's festive. I, I imagine it's different during the Christmas holiday period to other parts of the year. It is. Is, although, I mean, our strategy is to become more relevant to more people more often, and that means all the way through the year. So those key gifting moments, Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, Easter, summer picnic, all of those things are hugely important to us. And actually, as a result, we are now profitable pretty much all the way through the year, whereas I think historically it was a business that was just profitable at Christmas. But Christmas is done really well at Fortnum's. Yeah. The lights in front of the building attract uh, crowd across the street who are waiting uh, for the clocks to chime. We have turned the front of our building uh, into a advent calendar. Um, so the lights... Uh, we were just showing that on TV. Up, which is just fantastic. So it's a real spectacle, actually, and we are um, hugely proud of the creativity. The other thing that's been a real hit this year, and it's, I think something that I've really noticed... Um, there you go. There's the, the front of the shop now. The other thing that I've really noticed is um, the power of um, social media. 
Um, and in order to get that Instagram moment, you need movement and you need sound. We have some dancing mm -hmm. Christmas puddings mm -hmm. going up and down in our atrium. As one does. Which are stunning. <laughs> uh, with music provided by Fortnum's own staff who are singing okay. Christmas music in the background. Um, and of course, uh, these days for social media, people don't take pictures, they take video. And so you need movement and you need sound. And I think that's really resonated this year. So, so what do you sell the most of, apart from the jam? Do you have like one bestseller, so, Blockbuster? Um, so our Merry Lotus Biscuits um, sell really well. Uh, they're 1995. They're an amazing biscuit. They're sort of a milk chocolate with, uh, with fruits and, uh, and spices. Yeah. Our hampers obviously sell. Yeah. Uh, that's our iconic product. We've been selling hampers for hundreds of years. Um, and we'll sell the best part of 300,000 hampers this year to people all over the world. I mean, as you sat down, I was joking that I have a candle in, you know, in, in the background right here behind me. And you said actually Fortnum started as, as selling candles, which it I had did. no idea. It did. It was founded by Mr. Fortnum, who was a footman to Queen Anne, who asked for permission to take the melted down candles from the court at Royal, uh, St. James's Palace, remelt the, the beeswax into new candles and sell them from the site that we now trade on. Uh, on Piccadilly, and that was in 1707, so that's 316 years ago. And do we buy more candles than we do other, other things now? I mean, th I guess, you know, you always have to stay on top of trends. Yes. And so I don't know whether the jam has less sugar now that we're a little bit more careful on what so we, we eat. Yes. And things we, like that. So we definitely have to think about that. Um, we don't just sell candles anymore. Yeah. Obviously, we're a business <laughs> that's now centered on extraordinary food and drink. But to give you an idea of the latest sort of thing that we've been seeing, um, we've, we started distilling gin on site on our third floor. We've opened a gin still. It's called a Malfia. And actually, our pink gin uh, has become one of our best-selling products um, uh, literally overnight. It's been, uh, it's been a great success. And how much do you sell abroad? Um, about 20 or 25% of our sales go abroad. We've just relaunched deliveries into the EU post-Brexit, which has been a real headache for us. Um, our, our EU customers were very keen to access products in market. We've just found a way of um, re-delivering hampers and products to them uh, over the course of the last couple of months. And I really think that that's a business that's going to grow right. next year. And then the US as well is a big opportunity. But, but this, so for the EU, this was a problem of what, tariffs, taxes, or just the time no, it, it so took to taxes. get them? It's, it's the administrative burden okay. of shipping food into yeah. the EU because of the regulations around mm -hmm. food. But we found a way of opening our own uh, distribution center in Belgium uh, no. and we say export effectively to ourselves and then what we do is we sell that product on from there to our EU customers through a dedicated EU website. I know a lot of retailers have, have been, especially the higher end has said look the, the government needs to do something about VAT I mean have you seen a drop or does it not really apply well, to... Well, uh, I mean, our effective VAT rate is relatively low because, of course, we're a because food business. Food. Yeah. But, um, but, yes, I do think there's probably a case to be, um, uh, to be argued mm -hmm. for changing the rules back. And so VAT is available to... VAT refunders are available to our overseas tourists. I do think that that effect has been somewhat masked by, um, the, by the relative weakness of sterling, which makes yeah. Britain a very attractive place for overseas mm -hmm. visitors. And I suspect that's only going to get worse as the Paris Olympics start right. to hit next year, where the rest of Europe will become yeah. more attractive. So I do think there's a case to answer on yeah. that, yes. Okay, so interesting. Tom Atherton, thank you so much for joining us. The busiest man in the festive season, Tom and Santa Claus. He is, of course, the chief executive of Fortnum and Mason. Coming up, we look back at 2023, a period of inflation, rate debates, and difficult geopolitics. What has this meant for stocks as we near the end of the year? We'll discuss that next, and this is Bloomberg. back now halfway through Jamie Dimon's special incentive to stay five more years at the top of JP Morgan the bank's succession plan still appears unclear Bloomberg Sue Keenan has the details Jamie Dimon is viewed as a fiery CEO who's not going anywhere anytime soon in fact he's famous for avoiding questions about retirement or succession and he made it clear back in 2009 he thought it was in his best interest to avoid such questions which he referred to as drama but that hasn't stopped speculation within the bank about who the front runners to succeed him might be a management shuffle in mid 2021 put two co-heads of the consumer and community bank division in the spotlight just as the bank gave diamond a big bonus to stay on another five years Mary Marianne Lake and Jennifer Peepsack are widely seen as frontrunners or top contenders, although the insiders say neither is the clear frontrunner nor have they vied for the top job. The insiders are predicting more senior leadership changes or reshuffling might be needed to give these contenders more experience to run the whole company.
At the same time, J.P. Morgan Chase is more profitable than ever under Diamond, who's been there for 18 years. The stock is up 23% year-to-date and hit a high for the year on Friday. Sue Keenan, New York, for Bloomberg. Now, it's been a year of inflation, rate debates, job cuts, geopolitical tensions, and, of course, war. So what has it all meant for business? What has it all meant for the economy and, therefore, equities in 2023? And what's in store for next year? Well, joining us now is our very own expert, Tim Craighead from Bloomberg Intelligence. Tim, I mean, really, 2023 has been a very difficult year. So what surprised you the most, and what does it mean for next year? Yeah, I tell you, I think one of the biggest surprises to us has been the earnings resilience across European markets. If you look this year, or if you look over a two-year period to sort of take into consideration 2022's craziness, Europe's earnings have actually far outperformed the U.S. You wouldn't necessarily think of it that way, but earnings here, if you look at the core um, uh, Euro stocks, are up about 21% over two years. Your U.S. is up eight. So that's a surprise. Looking into next year, however, we're starting to see some negative revisions in Europe. Yeah. U.S. is ticking up. So that earnings performance picture looks set, at least for the first half, to shift away yeah. from, you, from Europe. But, Tim, so if you look at valuations, Europe is still definitely, you know, still depressed compared to the rest of the world. Yes. Well, there's no doubt. And part of that is simply composition that's not going to go away. We're heavy on financials, we're heavy on energy and materials. It's especially true with a market like the UK, where we also have a lack of the US's, you know, TMT. You know, we don't have a magnificent seven over here. And so that valuation difference, just in composition, is roughly half of the, the variance between Europe and the US. The other element is what's going on with, uh, with central bank policy, inflation expectations, interest rates. And if you look where we are right now at 13 times forward earnings for Europe, um, we need a significant change in interest rates to get it much further ahead. You know, we're, yeah. And that really is what it boils down to. So if you look at the underlying drivers, if you look at China, the stalled recovery, what, how does that play into your thinking? Yeah, I tell you, China looms large for Europe. Um, I think we may have chatted about this back a month or so ago. It's over 450 billion euros of revenue exposure across a top group of, of European companies that aggregate to almost a third of the index. Think metals and mining here in the UK, think autos in Germany, think luxury goods, etc. Um, first half of 2024 is a difficult comparison. So that's the bad news. The good news is they have their plenum coming up in January that usually is economically oriented as the third plenum. If they pull the stops out, which has been disappointing so far from the standpoint of policy initiatives, we could see a revival as we get into next year, as we look towards 2025. So think first half, second half for China. Tim, thank you so much. Tim Craig, Heather from Bloomberg Intelligence. Now, up next, Bloomberg Brief. Tom McKenzie is here in London, and this is Bloomberg.